you know, similar to what I showed you with oysters and with base scallops, we, um, to get a data set we could work with, we started with um, simple comparative um, feeding study with um, 16, I think, algal strains. So T ISO was our best performer. Um, the second one was Keat Cal. And then we have a nice distribution, so just statistically we're good. Um, the tetracellus we used to like is in the middle of the pack here, which is, you know, maybe significant, maybe not. So the first thing we did was look at um, which gross biochemical components are important here. It's a positive relationship between clam growth and protein in the diet. Again, this was equalized on biovolume. Positive relationship with um, total lipid in the diet. Um, somewhat negative relationship with carbohydrate, but a lot of variation. And the variation probably has to do something with the, the fatty acids and the sterols that at the time we did this study we weren't thinking about and I haven't gone back and done the arithmetic because I'm too busy approving time and attendance and stuff like that nowadays. So you have to have me come for, on vacation here more often. Remind me of all the things I haven't done. So, um, you know, here's, uh, we've talked about that plenty um, and that already. So for clams, we did um, a somewhat uh, different, we, we took a guess and we fed a 50% uh, POI-14 plat P diet, which maybe was a mistake. Uh, and then um, because you know, we had these data that I already showed you for oysters and bay scallops. And then we did the same with carboy cultured algae, pure cultures, you know, very dependable over time. And the mosque and feeding chambers Here's the same experimental design I showed you before for oysters and bay scallops with uh, both the, um, the uh, oops, yep, the amount, ach, the amount and the number of feedings varied experimentally. And you may recall this is what we expected to see and what we did see in uh, <coughs> oysters and bay scallops. And the units we used were the same as I told you about already. So um, in terms of growth, you know, did we get significant results? Well, <clears throat> you know, here the um, ration, yeah, that's ration, right, A ration. So the ration was significant, the regime was not. So they didn't care, uh, we're happy science nerds, something was significant. So here's what the data looked like plotted. So we have the you know, ration from, from one to 10%. And here, uh, you may notice, this is somewhat different than what we got for over this range. It's much lower, right? For um, regime, um, or, I'm sorry, conversion efficiency, both um, ration regime and the interaction were significant. So we're especially um, happy about that. And here's what our data looked like. And this is really different. This is not at all what um, conversion efficiency looked like in, in oysters and clams. <clears throat> and you know, this, this line here is, is kind of, this is zero. And on the low uh, diets and two regimes, we got basically no, uh, no growth. Uh, I'm sorry, a negative conversion efficiency. So they're actually using energy to, to use that diet. So they were getting le less than no nutrition out of it. Whereas at the, the big meals, they were actually getting a positive conversion efficiency. So a little bit puzzling results, you know, and you know, again, that's what we expected. Here's what we got in terms of growth. Here's what we expected in terms of conversion efficiency. Here's what we got in a summary way. So, if we look and assume that you know our conceptual model is correct, and as it was for oysters and bay scallops, this is where our results with hard clams fit. So for the same amount of food, you know we are getting much less growth, and you know and you know increase still increasing conversion efficiency even at the highest ration and at every regime. So, um, yeah, contrasting that with bay scallops and, and oysters again, you know, here's, here's the comparison. And so, you know, 
from, from your standpoint as clam farmers, most of you, you know, this tells you something about your expectations. Like um, your, um, where you would have a compromise is going to be a lot more food than I told you about, a lot more than the 10%. 10% in live weight, 10% of live weight and dry matter feed per day is going to get you a high conversion efficiency and a low growth relative to clams and, and oysters. And you're going to have to food, feed a whole lot more to top out your growth. And, and, and we haven't, and I haven't done that study yet. I haven't done that experiment to find out how much, how much you have to feed to max growth. It's more than 10%, yeah. I want some big summer meat. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, you know, how, how, do we, how do we reconcile this with other things we maybe know about clams? Um, you know, it appears that clams need way more food than scallops or oysters. That, you know, that's, I'll, I'll show you some evidence that that's true. Um, you know, and maybe the high lipid tetracelma strains are not that great for clams. And to tell you the truth, you know, I send hundreds of cultures out every year and, you know, clam farmers are the least likely to re-ask for tetras high lipid tetracelma strains. So, you know, practically speaking, it seems that those are not providing the, the kick that they do to oyster farmers. Every oyster farm, you know, on, in the country is using uh, plat P or, or uh, PLY429 in their hatcheries and, and loving it. And clam farmers, not so much. So, I mean, that, that's, you know, probably something that, um, you know, that need, clams need a little more work on their biochemical nutrition. Um, and, you know, did we actually, at the low, at the low feedings, it seems like we, we maybe were getting, like, not, not you know, not um, even... Uh, starting the feeding process, you know, because clams don't filter all the time. Th th there's a joke Sandy Shumway always says, well, they clam up. No kidding. You know, but um, so, you know, there's a, a bunch of reasons why we may have gotten these results. So here's some, you know, again, some conjecture, but maybe is, is helpful. Um, in places where people are growing clams and scallops or they're growing naturally, you know, scallops and oysters get to, to market in, you know, one year or one and a half years, and clams by us is like a three to four year crop. You guys have two, yeah. But oysters you can get in, in a year, right? Yeah, so I mean, and in the same place, right? So okay, so clams are, need more food. I mean, that, that's reasonable with that. Um, as I said, you know, the um, hatcheries are not always asking for this. Um, we did a bunch of literature research, and clams do filter, uh, are um, stimulated to feed at the total suspended solid concentrations we presented in, in the feeding chambers, so it's not that we didn't have enough cells for them to feed. And something we wor wonder about or worry about all the time with clams is in our chambers, the clams are sitting on top of a screen, and they're happier if they're buried. And my colleague, Roxana Smolowitz at Roger Williams University, when we worked with her with hard clams. If they're a certain size, she puts a rubber band around them. Uh, and apparently they feel secure with something pressing back on their shells and otherwise they spend energy closing themselves. So, I mean, here's, again, it's conjecture about why, why the clams are different, but there, you know, there's some observation that would indicate that our results make sense in terms of why. Um, yeah, yeah. And then um, we have some data from my former postdoc, Eve Gallimani, um, on feeding of oysters and clams. Actually, this, she did this work in the Indian River on, on a second postdoc after she left our, our lab. I don't know. Any of you meet Eve? Eve Gallimani? She was with the Smithsonian site in the Indian River. She's from Barcelona, but she's awesome. Anyway, so what, um, what she found, you know, using uh, biodeposition apparatus in, in that environment was that, you know, oysters um, in the same place, in the same, at the same moment were, uh, you know, what, three times, you know, four times the clearance rate, filtration rate, also much higher, uh, rejection proportion, 
in oysters was that, and she, she made the slide, and I'm, I don't know, I guess she wanted to talk about each separately, but the oysters, you know, were rejecting a small percentage of what they removed, and um, the organic ingestion rate was uh, seven-ish, and absorption efficiency was 60-ish, which is kind of typical for, uh, for mussels that we saw before. Uh, the clams were rejecting a lot more of what they cleared, so they chose to not eat as much. The organic ingestion rate was you know, less than half of what it was for oysters, and the absorption efficiency was also appreciably lower. So now we have you know, performance under natural conditions data consistent with what we found in our, our lab feeding experiment that the, you know, even under the same natural conditions, clams are not using resources at the same, uh, the same uh, intensity, let's say, as, as oysters. Uh, also, we, um, <laughs> we concluded from this that, you know, uh, nursery culture is a choice how long you keep them in the hatchery until you put them out in, in raw water. Um, we're telling people, put your clams out in raw water as fast as you can because you're not going to get much bang for your buck if you feed them cultured algae. So it's, you know, again, another very practical finding from a lot of, a lot of complicated science. And that's uh, questions quickly, and then we we'll take a little break, and then I'll do one more thing with you this afternoon. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, how much your algae costs for a The cost? Yeah, about two or 50 ml. Oh, to send to you? Yeah. Did you pay your federal income tax last year? <laughs> you already paid for them. Yeah, no, there's, there's not many people in the country that want this tax rebate, but it's one your government offers you. So um, within reason, we'll send you starter cultures, um, you know, once a year. If every two weeks you're sending me an email saying, can I have an, you know, another starter culture, I'm going to say, I I'm going to work with you to teach you how to keep this alive yourself because we can't keep up with you. You know, so we don't offer subscription, but... Um, just email me, um, tell me what strains you need. We typically send out two 10 mil tubes. One of them you subculture into your situation, the other you keep in your incubator in case the first one fails and you have a second try. Uh, and you know, we, do, we send um, close to 1,000 starter cultures every year to shellfish hatcheries all around the country, to academic um, people. You know. So that's that's a service that we're happy to provide, and just just ask if you want want starter cultures. I don't I don't have any in my pocket today, <laughs> but apparently we're going to plan for to get some. Well, I'm, again, I'm not so sure. Um, you, you definitely want T ISO and Key Cal, um, you know, and that might be that might be what you want instead of Tetrasalmus because people are not succeeding. Yeah, in, in oysters, right. And, you know, and then, so diatoms, as I said, have a little bit, ketosterol especially, has a bit of cholesterol. And, um, you know, it's going to provide that for you. Where does the roto rank as far as the cholesterol? I'm trying to remember if we even did any cryptophytes. I don't think we... I don't think we did. Yeah, because they were off our list for other reasons. So, you know. All right. 